Hello everyone! A few weeks ago we got an exciting announcement in the lore department since Blizzard has decided to partner with Random House to bring Blizzard fans lots of amazing new novels from the Warcraft and Starcraft universe plus more, which means that they've teamed up with a new publisher and they also said that one of the first novels will be about Illidan. I personally hope that this novel is going to give some insight about Illidan's mindset back during the Burning Crusade and also of course a link to the upcoming expansion, since back during the Burning Crusade I believe that they did Illidan's character no justice. They turned him from this anti-hero trying to do good but you know, having his own methods to do so, into a guy that was just out of his mind and a bad guy for the sake of being a bad guy. I hope that this secret mission that they've been hinting at with the Legion announcement, with the whole Demon Hunter thing, I hope that it's going to give a new perspective to Illidan's story. Perhaps Illidan knew more than we did at the time, was trying to do the right thing all along, would fit perfect with his character, or perhaps it's going to be a completely different storyline. Time will tell. We do know that it's going to be written by William King, which means that we'll have this book in 2016, as well as a novel by Christy Golden connected to the Warcraft movie, and then we have the Warcraft Chronicles to look forward to. All of that is future talk though. Right now, we're here, so let's do a little Q&A, starting off with... Hey Noble, I noticed a long time ago that the Blingtron's suffix number, 3000, 4000, 5000, they change every expansion. I also know that you can fight him during a Brawler's Guild fight, but other than him giving you daily presence, that's all I know. Do you know anything about him? Maybe who created him? What is his purpose? I would really like to know. Thanks, smiley face. We don't really know the story behind the Blingtrons, and that's most likely because it was added as a fun item for engineers to hand out presents to other people and have something fun to make. It was a fun item for engineering. However, ever since the 5000 model, we've been receiving disturbing messages describing a whole war that we never knew about. The messages say, Unidentified threats attack Peacekeeper 011 units in the deepest caves of the Magnetic Chasm. We have no idea where this Magnetic Chasm is, or if it even on Azeroth itself, considering that Blinktron's 4000's farewell message is Goodbye nearby living beings, my unique presence is requested in another dimension. So that could mean that this whole war is taking place in another dimension. Now as we read through the messages, we find out that over 121,000 Robo units, they've been assembled and they now march to face an unknown threat in the magnetic chasm below the molten Eternium Sea. The order has been given to increase generosity circuits in all Blinktron units to minimize organic awareness. So all those friendly daily gifts that we receive from the Blinktrons, they're actually to keep us unaware and distracted from this war. A virus infected their units, a so-called clockwork assembly system hack. It's an effective virus since it appears to be beneficial to the robots, so they eagerly accept it, until it begins to corrupt their AI by overloading the generosity circuits. There is no known way to to nullify the effect without destroying the host. But the leader, OX0001, he gives the order to not hesitate and destroy them anyways. The messages end with information regarding the enemy's leader. Monsters in size, it calls itself IRTO. No further information was obtained, but the organic awareness of the war is growing too quickly. Above ground units possibly infected, see plans for next gen Blinktron remotes to call on veteran units that can assess and destroy. These next-gen Blinktron remotes, they're probably the ones that we're making right now, the 5000 model, since this model will attack any older Blinktron model because they're infected by the virus, and the only way to nullify it is by taking them out. The 5000 model also has a new farewell message. He says, My presence is requested for duty. I must leave immediately. That was probably the worst robot voice ever. Regardless, a war is taking place somewhere in the universe, maybe on Azeroth, maybe in a different dimension. A war unknown to us all, as we let ourselves be distracted by shiny gifts and dance parties. Who knows though, maybe the next gen of the Blinktrons will call upon the organic races to help them out with this war, and maybe, just maybe, they will reward us with even more gifts. I sure hope so. Next question. Hello Nobo, I love the videos you put out and not a lot of people have talked or discussed this in any lore video. But to those that don't understand, could you perhaps enlighten us in a video with the origins of the humans? I know Vrykuls are involved, but not much has ever been explained. Thanks from Sharus Smith. 
You're right, the Vrykuls do play a part in it, and the Vrykuls are creatures created by the Titans, most likely to help them shape the world, but the reason has never been clarified. Over time, the Vrykul, as so many other creations of the Titans, they were hit by a curse, causing their young ones to be born weak and ugly. Their king Ymiron believed that this curse was placed upon them by the Titans, for who but the Titans themselves, the one that created them, could bestow such a curse, could have such power, so they believed that it was the Titans that cursed them, but according to Bram Bronzebeard, it was actually the curse of flesh placed upon them by the old gods. Either way, Ymiron ordered his people to get rid of these malformed infants, their strength was diluted by their very existence, so all malformed infants born of Raikou mothers and fathers, they were supposed to be destroyed upon birth. Not everyone followed these orders though, some parents simply couldn't take the life of their own children no matter how ugly or weak they were. Despite the king's orders, they sheltered their children, they found them a new home far away, and this location far away would be on the continent now known as the Eastern Kingdoms. This is taken from one of the death Q&As, what is the relation between the Order of the Silver Hand, Tear's Hand and Watcher Tear from Ulduar? Long ago, on the continent that would eventually become known as the Eastern Kingdoms, a small group of creatures struggled to survive, using the limited supplies provided to it by its parents, with just the benefit of their children on an unfamiliar shoreline. These creatures, eventually called humans, would occasionally take to gathering around a fire, whilst trying to read from scrolls telling of ancient heroes and leaders, tales from the civilization that had cast these creatures out. One of these scrolls spoke of a great leader, a paragon of order and justice who sacrificed his right hand in a fight against an unfathomable evil. Although it was within this hero's power to fix his hand after the fighting had ended, the hero instead chose to replace it with a closed fist made of the purest silver. In this way, the hero impressed upon those who followed him that true order and justice can only be accomplished through personal sacrifice. This hero, who slipped into memory long ago, went by the name of Tyr. So the humans, they come from the seed race of Raikul, they were brought to the Eastern Kingdoms by their parents. This bit of information about Tyr losing his hand and whatnot, it's related to the story Dawn of the Aspects, where Tyr, together with future Aspects, they take on the mighty proto-drake Galagrond. I've done a full video on the story Dawn of the Aspects if you want to check it out, and hopefully Legion will give us more details as to what happened with Tyr, since... When requested during Northrend with Raw of the Lich King, there were all these Titan Keepers, but Titan Keeper Tear was simply missing. We had these legends of old, this, this, these tales of a hero that wouldn't replace his hand. And now with Legion they said that we would encounter two Titan Keepers, so hopefully one of them is going to be Tear. Now not all details about the early days of the humans are known, but what we do know is that by the time of the Troll Wars, which ended around 2800 years ago, give or take a few years, the humans, they first lived in different tribes. As the High Elves fought for their lives against the Trolls, the nomadic humans fought amongst each other. But one tribe knew that the Trolls would soon become a problem and they had to unite. This tribe, known as Arafi, led by the chieftain Foradin, they went around for six years, they tried to unite the clans by either outmaneuvering them or simply kicking the crap out of them. After every victory, the Arafi offered peace and equality to the conquered people, they offered them a place in their clan, and so they won the loyalty of those they had beaten. Confident that they could now hold their own against the troll warbands, or even the reclusive elves it need be, the Arafi warlords decided to construct a mighty fortress city in the southern regions of Lordaeron. The city-state, named Strom, became the capital of the Arafi nation named Arafor. Eventually, the High Elf realized that they needed some help in the war against the Trolls, and by this time, the humans had a mighty army at their disposal. Together with the High Elves, they worked on kicking the crap out of the Trolls, the High Elves, they taught some of the humans about magic, and afterwards, they went their separate ways, yet the Elves would not forget about their debt to the humans. As time went on, the Arafi Empire eventually split into separate kingdoms, known as Gilneas, Alterek, Dalaran, Lordaeron, Kaltaras, Stormwind, and then you had Strom itself, which renamed itself to Stromgard. These kingdoms would eventually come back together in the form of the Alliance of Lordaeron. They would team up with the High Elves against a new threat known as the Horde. That's a whole different story though. Now the funny thing is, with the whole origin of the Vrykul and the humans and whatnot, is that many years later, a human by the name of Arthas would journey to Northrend and he would become the Lich King. As we quest during Raw of the Lich King, we find out that Ymiron's wife, the same king 
king that millennia ago kicked the weak and ugly children out of his society, he's teamed up with the human Lich King and now his wife is trying to awaken her husband from his slumber. We take her out, only for the Lich King to show up and take Ymiron to place him within Utgard Pinnacle, where we take out the undead king. This meant that the so-called ugly and weak children of the Vrykul, one day they became more powerful than the king himself, and he even allied himself with the god of death, which in truth was also actually a human merged together with the Lich King. I don't know, I thought it was pretty funny. The Vrykul pretty much created their own enemies. What would have happened if they didn't kick these weak and ugly children out of their society? What would have happened? Who knows? I thought it was pretty funny. Just a heads up for the next questions, these are going to be about Legion, so as always, if you're desperately avoiding spoilers or speculation about the next expansion, then this would be the best moment to turn off the video. The first question about Legion is something that I said last week, which is, when did Blizzard say that the Old Gods and the Burning Legion were working together? To be honest, I was a little bit brash with my statement, and it's not set in stone that the Legion and the Old Gods are actually going to be working together. It's not clearly stated by Blizzard. The reason why I think this might happen, why I thought that this was going to happen, is if you go to Xavius' description on the website, it says the following. With an army of vile satyrs at his command, Xavius will stop at nothing to vanquish all who oppose the Burning Legion. Now we know that Xavius is going to connect it to the whole Emerald Nightmare storyline, and the Emerald Nightmare storyline, as far as we know, is tightly connected to Nazoth. Nazoth is an old god with his minion that's making sure to vanquish all that oppose the Burning Legion, to which I thought, like, hang on. That's really cool, that's awesome, these are old gods and legion that are going to work together. However, as some of you have pointed out to me, and you're absolutely right about that, it doesn't have to be like that. It could also be a plan of the old gods to use the legion to their benefit, possibly break out of the prisons with Sargeras entering Azeroth. Just the same scheme that they tried to use during the War of the Ancients, and as far as we know, Sargeras back then didn't know about the old gods, so apologies that I made it look like it was set in stone. This is purely my own interpretation of the information, so... I think that there's definitely a possibility of Legion and Old God working together. I also think that it sounds really cool to happen, but it's not set in stone. Which brings us to the final question for today, which is something that I wanted to talk about during the last Q&A, but I simply ran out of time before I could. I ask you guys and girls to leave a comment with your suggestions for followers, locations and artifacts, and... Damn, did you all deliver. There are so many possibilities that Blizzard could run with, there have been some awesome suggestions, but these are the ones that you suggested for artifacts, as well as some that are confirmed by Blizzard, or simply my own interpretation. There are a lot of artifacts to consider, there's going to be an artifact for each class with each spec, so I hope I won't forget about any of them. If I did, then my apologies, I did my very best. Starting off with the Death Knights. For Blood, there is going to be Maw of the Damned, and this has been confirmed by Blizzard. For Eons, the demon known as Gorilix the Flesh Ripper used his massive axe to steal the life force of his enemies and replenish his own. The Maw will bleed dry anything it touches, eating is all it knows. For Frost, Icebringer and Soul Reaper, also confirmed by Blizzard. Forged from the remains of Frostmourne, these are more traditional and based around Death Knight fantasy. They're going to have skulls, there's going to be frost, there's going to be more skulls, there's going to be different skulls. It's very scully, it's very Death Knight. Unholy, none that I could find that are confirmed, but there was a weapon called Soul Rent that popped up as a potential artifact for the Unholy Death Knights. Not much else is known about the weapon, except for the picture that popped up, so Soul Rent might be an artifact for Unholy. Druids, Balance, Scythe of a Loon. A staff with one of the fangs from the demigod Goldrin attached, this scythe was created to get the druids back from under control, but instead it transformed them into Worgen. Worgen were then banished to the Emerald Dream by Malfurion, but later summoned back with the help of the scythe. It has quite a big story behind it, but its current location is unknown. For Feral, Fangs of the First Night Saber, also confirmed by Blizzard. Not much is known about the First Night Saber, nor what his fangs might do, but we do know that it will change the appearance of your form, and this is the artifact you're going to get. Guardian. Hard to say, since Guardian Druids, as far as I know, they play in their bear form. I suggest something connected to Ursok, the bear-like demigod, right? Ursok, bears, very much like the Guardian. Then combine that with Brawl Bear Mantle's massive gloves that look absolutely amazing. I think that would be really cool. So something with Brawl's gloves combined the spirit of Ursok, maybe invoke the spirit of Ursok, make your bear form look different. 
I think that would be awesome. Restoration. Someone suggested the Horn of Cenarius, used by Tyrande to wake up Malfurion, and they used by Malfurion to waken the rest of the Druids and summon the power of nature to destroy Archimond. This was also used during the Cataclysm to call on Goldrin and Druids to assist players with defeating Ethralon the Gatekeeper. I think it's a really cool suggestion, has a lot of story behind it, but I do wonder how it would look with a Druid fighting wielding a horn as his weapon. Pretty awesome suggestion, but I wonder if it would really work. Hunters, Beast Mastery, a gun showed up as a possible artifact, so perhaps the Nesting Wary 4000 or some sort of gun granted by Hammond. I personally love to see Rock de la Relongbow of the Ancients show up as an artifact. This is an epic bow you could get back in Classic, but it seems unlikely since the other slots have already been confirmed. Apparently Beastmaster uh, should get a gun. I fear that another bow will not happen. Marshmanship. Tastura, Legacy of the Windrunners, also confirmed by Blizzard. Legend has it that this high elven family heirloom, once wielded by an infamous ranger general, can turn a mediocre archer into a master marksman and make a master truly peerless. Survival, the Eagle Spear, confirmed by Blizzard. It's going to have lore connected to the new High Mountain Torrents, where you'll defeat the beast that defeated the weapon's last owner, and then you'll claim the weapon for yourself. Survival hunters are going to melee with a pet next to them in Legion, which is why you're getting a spear. Mages, Arcane. I'd say that a Tish would be awesome, but a Tish is safely in the hands of Ketgar, who seems to have need of it during Legion. Another great Archmage was Antonidas, the one that trained Jaina, lost his life at the ends of Arvis, so his staff could also be an excellent option. Fire. Fellow Malorn, confirmed by Blizzard. This is the weapon that Kilfa Sunstrider used to fight Arthas with in Ice Crown. Arthas had broken the blade before with Frostmourne as he took Kilfa's father's life, but Kill had it reforged, and as it goes with Elven Blades, reforging them makes them stronger. It was lost after the battle with Arthas, but will be found again in Legion. For Frost, Ebon Chill, Great Staff of Elodi, also confirmed by Blizzard. This is the staff of the very first Guardian of Tidus Fall, and it executes unnatural iciness, allowing its wielder to keep a cold, sharp, and collected mind, even in face of overwhelming odds. Monks. For the Brewmaster, I'd say something in the direction of the Staff of the Monkey King. For those that have seen the movie The Forbidden Kingdom, you might know why I'd like to see this weapon, and if you haven't seen this movie yet, I can highly recommend it. The Staff of the Monkey King is actually in the game as a quest item, which we use to get for the Monkey King, and in the description it says that you feel a vast power within this simple looking staff. Try as you might, it will not let you wield it. Considering all the other artifact possibilities, I'm sure that we're worthy of the staff by now, and the staff of the Monkey King could be great. Mistweavers, Shaloon, Staff of the Mists, confirmed by Blizzard. This legendary staff was used by the last Emperor of Pandaria to shroud his homeland in mist, and it resonates with his everlasting legacy of wisdom and perseverance. Windwalker, someone in the comments made an awesome suggestion, uh, Fist of Swen. These are some kinds of paws or lightning oriented fist weapons. They might even have a visual effect that your arms become like paws. I thought this sounded really cool. Something in the direction of, you know, melee weapons for Windwalker, that could be great. Paladins, my class, holy, something to make you look like this, because damn. This just looks awesome. I think it's called the Hammer of the Lightbringer, which would be really cool. A lot of you suggested this as well. And it might have actually been shown as an artifact preview. We're not certain there is a hammer with a symbol on it. Could be the Hammer of the Lightbringer, but something in this direction could be awesome. For protection, a shield is very hard to place since there aren't that many notable shields in the game. When we started speculating about this, you got like the Bulwark of Asenov and you got Bulvar Four Dragon Shield. But that's about it. Someone in the comments suggested something from the Naru treasury. We're almost certain that the Ashbringer was forged from the core of a Naru. So I can't imagine the Naru not being possession of a Bulwark of Light, for instance. Imagine how freaking epic it would be wielding a shield of solidified light. A literal Bulwark against the darkness. That's what they said in the comments and in my opinion sounds really cool. Now if we can only get Leodrin to give up Queldalar, we'd have our artifacts sorted for this spec. Retribution, the Ashbringer, confirmed by Blizzard. It is said that this sword, forged by Magni Bronzebeard, bestows the glory of the light upon his wielder, empowering them to render enemies into ash. 
It's currently in the hands of Tyrion Fordring, but Legion will have certain events transpire that will allow us to obtain the Ashbringer. For the priests in the Holy Spec, I'd recommend Benediction. In the past, priests they had a questline which you could get from Molten Core. The questline started with the Eye of Divinity, similar to how the Hunter's questline started with the Ancient Petrified Leaf. A big questline followed, where you would eventually get your hands on a staff, which could be transformed into either Anathema or Benediction, with each staff having its own stats. It's not surprising that I'd recommend Anathema for the Shadow Spec artifacts. Now, I've been told that Blizzard has already said that they won't go with this weapon. They got something else in mind, but honestly, I really thought that this recommendation was so cool, I would love to see this weapon make a return. Now say that this one is not part of the artifact possibilities, there was this Draenei Priest in the novel Knight of the Dragon with a staff, that could also be very cool, but this one, Benediction, it just has such a history behind it. For discipline, I suggest Fearbreaker, which is a family heirloom of the Bronzebeard clan, passed down in Magni's family for hundreds of years until Magni Bronzebeard gave it to Anduin. It is known the taste of blood in certain hands, but it has also been known to heal the wounds. Later on in the storyline, Anduin gave the weapon to Bane, but Bane then had to return it as Garrosh decided to attack Fedamore, and he felt like he wasn't worthy of the weapon. I think Fearbreaker would be awesome. Rogues. I've had a lot of suggestions for the rogues, but they can all fall pretty much in all the different specs. One suggestion, which I thought was really cool, Corona's Daggers, also known as Kingsbane. This weapon was used to kill the King of Stormwinds, Varian's father. It would be awesome to run around with that in your hands, like be like, hey Varian, look what I got. Could be pretty damn awesome. Valera's daggers, of course, they look similar to the shards of Azanov. Could be awesome as well. Sorry if I say awesome a lot of times. I'm very excited about the artifact system. Now, these weapons were picked up by Valera from the Halls of Legends in Orgrimmar after proving her worth to Rhaegar Urfury. Then there are the Zul'jin's arm blades who were suggested for combat rogues. And honestly, who wouldn't want these badass weapons at their side as their artifacts? Shamans. Elemental. Surprising to me, but apparently really requested by the shamans in the comments, it's Sulfurus Hand of Ragnaros. I have to admit, it's, it's very connected to the elements, but I'm not sure if existing legendary weapons are on the table for possibilities. If that's not the case, then maybe an Obundo staff would be a better choice. Enhancement is going to get the Doomhammer, which is confirmed by Blizzard. This legendary weapon is now going to be in our hands, and it seems to be the version of our universe, considering that it has the Frostwolf symbol on it. I talked about this during the last Q&A. A lot of people are asking like, which version of the Doomhammer is this? Is this the alternate or our Doomhammer? It seems like it's ours. It seems like Thrall, similar to Tyrion, is going to have certain events happen to him and then he's going to give the hammer to the players. Then there is Restoration and I had a hard time coming up with suggestions for Restoration. So I went to Twitter and a few of you came back with a suggestion linking to the Elemental Lord of Water Neptulon. Neptulon's trident could be really cool to have. You can roleplay as King Trident. You could have your little mermaid surrounding you. I... No? Just me? That thinks that's cool? Okay then. But still, something related to Neptulon that makes a lot of sense. Warlock's Affliction, Skull of Gul'dan. This artifact has been passed down throughout the story until it eventually ended up in the hands of Illidan Stormrage. It's unknown what happened to it afterwards after the fall of Illidan, but it's said to have great power locked inside and it was even able to whisper from beyond the grave. Being a trinket is simply not enough. That's not enough status for the Skull of Gul'dan. You might not call it a weapon, but imagine putting this on a stick and you'll surely be able to bash some heads in. Demonology. Someone suggested Drakfool's dagger, the orc who was with Gul'dan as he entered the Tomb of Sargeras, and Gul'dan lost his life. Maiev later showed up near the Tomb of Sargeras, met with Drakfool, who explained his tale to her, and afterwards he kinda disappeared. I'm still hoping to see Drakfool show up as a follower, and getting his daggers might be pretty awesome. Destruction, the Jeweled Scepter of Sargeras. Another artifact that was found within the Tomb of Sargeras, used by Ner'zhul to create portals all across Draenor, this caused the destruction of the planets and transformed it into Outland. Last we heard of the Scepter was Ner'zhul taking it with him as he stepped through the portal, ended up in front of Kil Jaden, and there he was turned into the Lich King. We don't know what happened to the Scepter of Sargeras, it might be in the Twisted Nether somewhere, could be a pretty cool artifact. Warriors, I got a ton of suggestions for possible warrior artifacts, so there are a lot of possibilities. These are the ones that I picked. 
For arms, I would say Exocenarius, also known as Broxigar's X. This weapon is the only thing known to us that has ever damaged the Titus Sargeras, as Broxigar bravely laid down his life to save the world. It's currently in the possession of Broxigar's niece Fura, and although I think it would be brilliant to see Fura show up in the whole nightmare storyline, the X as an artifact could also be really cool. Fury, Shalator, and Elamain. This pair of magical elven blades were forged during the War of the Ancients, and they eventually came into the possession of Jaina Proudmoore. She granted them to Varian Rin, who at the time had been split into two separate beings by the Black Dragon Onyxia. Together, these two beings were able to take out the Black Dragon, and in the process, they were transformed back into one single being, with the twin blades coming together as well, forming Shalamain. Now you might wonder, how is it possible to get Shalafor and Elamain if it's currently Shalamain? There's no real possibility for it right now, but... There are rumors going around that a certain fate might happen to Varian Rin. Keyword might, we don't know. So who knows, maybe with the removal of Varian, maybe with his death or maybe something else gonna happen. Something to transform Shalomain back into two individual blades. Protection. Now this is not really confirmed, but they did mention it during the presentation. They were talking about going to a certain tomb of a legendary ancient Vrykul king. Inside, you overcome ancient curses while claiming a sword and shield forged from the scales of the black dragon Alfarian, who would eventually be known as Deathwing. So that's the artifact protection warriors can look forward to. Now I found it really interesting that like tanking specs still have like a melee weapon and a shield. So it seems like dual wielding specs or you know protection specs. They will be getting two artifacts. Probably with one simple single system connected to it. If we look at the weapons you can see like the upgrade talent trees that is locked into the weapon. They will probably be split over two different artifacts. But I thought it was really cool to see that you'll actually get two of them. Now this brings me to the final clause that we can you know imagine an artifact for. The demon hunter. Hunters. You got two specs. First off, Havoc, which is the melee DPS spec. A lot of you suggested the Twin Blades of Asanov, and although it would be really cool, I can see why it was suggested. I think Illidan is going to keep these specific blades. In the gameplay that was shown, we do see Demon Hunters using a similar model to the Warglaive, so they'll probably get some sort of version of it, but not the specific Twin Blades of Asanov. Then there is Vengeance, the tanking spec, the final one that we have to fill in, the tank spec for the Demon Hunters, and honestly, I have no idea. The easy answer would be a different set of Warglaives, or perhaps a weapon taken from a powerful demon, maybe some, some demonic horns, or I don't know, shoulder pads of Manorov, something like that. Demon Hunter lore isn't really that rich yet, so... I honestly can't give a good suggestion. Maybe this is a good opportunity to ask you guys and girls to help me out with this. What artifacts for Demon Hunters, or what artifacts in general that I haven't mentioned here yet for any of the classes, what artifacts would you like to see in the game? Leave a comment down below since I had a lot of fun reading all your suggestions last time and I can't wait to read more. Also, as always, if you have questions that you'd like to see featured in an upcoming Q&A, then by all means, leave them in the comment section down below or send them in over at ask.fm. Right everyone, I think I've been going on for long enough, so thank you very much for watching everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos and until next time guys, see ya!